Welcome, amazing agents from across the country. Today is May 10th, 2018, and this is Mastermind Call number 176. Um, this is Jim. My three partners are on the line. We are incredibly excited this week. We just came from a great planning session next week, and we got all kinds of great additions, improvements in store for you guys for in the upcoming months. Um, other than that, um, nothing else that I need to share this week. We've, we have three people in the queue. Tim, anything you would like to share with the group before we get started? I do have something. I wanted to let everybody on the call know that because you're on the call, you're going to be the first to know about this, and we're not going to make a general announcement about it probably until next week. But uh, shortly, sometime during the day today, go to your All the Leads website and go to alltheleads.com and type in alltheleads.com forward slash premium leads. And on that page, you're going to see a little uh, form and uh, a little spiel about what we're doing there. We're trying another market test. So we thought we'd uh, award the people that are on the call with it, and it's not quite ready to be up yet. We just kind of finished up what we were working on this morning, and we're getting ready to put something up for it. And we'll let you know what it is, but uh, it's kind of a cool program that we've got, and we're going to let you take a look at it. We've got a new lead source we're going to be working through and vetting with you. We're going to market it a little bit different way. So let's take a look at that when you uh, get a chance, and if you're interested and you'd like to participate, there's a little form there you can fill out. Let us know, and we'll get right back to you. Anyway, it's uh, www.alltheleads.com forward slash premium leads. Don't go looking for it now because it's not there yet. And uh, probably by the end of the call, I'll tell you that it is there and you can go take a look. And Tim, at the risk of being wrong, because it doesn't happen often, but occasionally I am, um, these are the leads that we've already determined that there is an interest in selling the property. These are people that kind of have somewhat already raised their hands. Is that accurate? Yeah, these are leads that have already been worked and all that, but we'll explain more about it in, in some detail on the page itself. And we've got a different way of marketing it, and we kind of want to try a different arrangement with them. But, yeah, they're leads that already have been worked. We know there's property in them, and, and some discussion has already happened. Excellent. Wonderful. I tried all to right, get him Chad. To call it forward slash Glenn Gary leads, but he wouldn't do it. Go to your no. corner. Chad, I'm surprised you know what Glenn, Glenn Ross, Glenn Gary is. You're too young for that. That movie was happened about the time you were born, right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the all-time great sales me meetings. The Glenn Gary leads are the are the are the good leads. The Glenn Ross are the ones that cold calling, right? Yeah. First prize in the that's Cadillac. It. Second prize. Anybody? <laughs> okay. Is that a, no. Is that a steak knife? Okay. Right. Cal yeah. Only the what's that Geico commercial? Uh, only only winners get sprinkles. You know you got to same concept. All right, and Chad, anything you want to uh, share with the group from our training and uh, coaching and anything from that perspective you'd like to share? I don't have anything today really specifically. Let's jump into our queue. All right, and Tom, anything you'd like to share with the group? Yes, I would. I just always like to remind everybody that if you need anything, our support team is always there to help you. You just need to send an email to support at alltheleads.com. But also, if you are setting up your marketing campaigns or tweaking them, if you need any help, please let us know, too, because, um, you know, what, that's what we're here to do. Uh, we always make sure that you uh, use our best practices of recommending our mailbox motivator solution for the mailing of your uh, letters and also our probate websites and uh, if you don't have time to make the calls we also have our isa call center so we're here to help just please reach out to us yeah we're working on going out and taking the listing for you and sending you a check but that's probably uh that's probably not till next year <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a later addition. So we're really trying to make this as foolproof as possible, guys. So good good addition, uh, Tom. Thanks for mentioning that. All right. Well, we have three in the queue. If this follows the normal procedure, we have three people now, and then I'll have to beg for people, and then about five minutes of, we'll have ten more people come in. <laughs> so please, guys, come on early, so we have time to thoroughly answer all your questions. We try to keep these calls at an hour. I think last week we went an hour and fifteen minutes in. It's not that we're in a hurry to get out of here. We just want to respect your time so you can schedule around these calls and you can figure on it being an hour. So please, if you have something you're going to share, please, or you want to know a question, anything you need to talk about with the group or our coaches, just hit star six and hit one now, 
rather than later. All right. Well, our first up this week is phone number ending in 1359. You're up first. Yeah, this is Jeff Seth. I'm uh, brand new, just getting started, uh, just getting my first round of letters out. And as I'm looking through uh, the leads that have come in, um, I'm just curious if anybody handles the leads as far as where the uh, personal representative appears to be a spouse at the same address as, uh, as, as the person deceased. Do you send a different letter out? Do you handle those differently? Um, I mean, my guess is there's still the possibility of uh, real estate there. Maybe the person who's a personal representative could be wanting to downsize or make a change. So there's still some possible business there. But uh, I'm just seeing these leads for the first time and trying to figure out do we market anything differently or the same thing across the board regardless? Yeah, good question. Um, so I'll point you to a resource first. If you go to otherleads.com in the top of the right, you'll see blog. Click yep. on blog, and then there's a series that I do called Tips from the Trainer. And it's probably a year old. You'll probably have to scroll down a ways, but there's one that says, Should I Call Surviving Spouses? And that's okay. kind of a video, a, a video training that we did. So watch that when you get a chance. Um, I always reach out to the surviving spouses, mainly because of my, my first real probate deal where I kind of put my team together and pulled in multiple people to help me with a, sing, a single solution. Um, it does require a more empathetic approach. Um, so we know through uh, studies in, in the in the, the senior transition industry, we know that 79.9% of senior citizens plan to die in their primary residence. But we also know that that doesn't happen. Because that's why the, the nursing home industry has, is exploding for this generation. So people typically don't have a plan. They, 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 just, they just don't get around to planning you know, that for, their, for their death. It's just no uncomfortable thing. So a lot of surviving spouses maybe a month or two months out following a death, you know, they won't, they'll still think they're going to live there forever, but it's just a matter of time until property maintenance costs, like, the, you know, if you had two social security incomes and now they have one, <coughs> and two people helping share the work in a household, now there's one. So there's a lot of things that spouses early in the process haven't thought of that will, what will kind of hit them like a ton of bricks at some point. Um, so it's always good to be in front of the spouse as soon as possible, but don't call them up and say, hey, I'm calling about the house at 123 Wallet Street. I'm the best damn realtor in town, because then you're just going to shut them down. So right. uh, as, as we teach, be the hub and the wheel and use the spokes around that wheel to provide value to them in any way you can. And when they bring real estate into the conversation, that's the time to talk about real estate. Don't call an 84-year-old widow and upset her even more because you want to go list the house because that's what everybody else is doing, and she'll get that, and she'll be in that mindset probably. Um, but call her and say, you know, listen, we, we like to reach out to families who are going through this because we realize how hard it can be, especially, in a, in a, you know, if you've lost a spouse. Um, there's a lot of challenges. So we have senior moving companies, relationships with, with you know, different um uh, communities throughout town. We can help you find suitable housing if that's something that, that you need. We can even help you transition your property into a rental so that you, know, you have more income and you can live with family. Um, it really just starts with us understanding your position. We can make some positions. Would, would you have 10 minutes to talk later this week sometime? And I haven't mentioned selling the house. But once we get there and talk about it, property management is probably not the best option. Like turning it into a rental is probably not as good of an option as liquidating the asset. Um, you know, and even if they move in with family. So, but it, it, be empathetic. Like understand their position and how much this this hurts to them, and that they probably there's more likely than not they're not thinking of selling the home, but they haven't realized all the problems they're going to have down the road. Um, so provide value any way you can to build the relationship and trust. And then when that day comes, like, and, and it, for, you know, for all of us, it will, but 
at some point they're going to go, holy shit, I got to sell this house and, and downsize, move in with my daughter, go to the other side of the country, whatever it is. If you're the person who has tried to help them any way you could, you know, they're, that you'll be the, the only realtor in the world. So I would, as far as, as that's, you know, the approach, as far as changing your marketing pieces, Honestly, I mean, it just creates a lot more complexity in your campaign, and it's going to take you a lot of time. I think that if you choose a letter that you feel like does a good job of presenting that the service of your service is kind of the hub and the wheel and saying we can do all of these different things, um, one marketing piece should apply to anyone in this situation. Uh, so I don't think you have to run a whole separate spouse campaign. Uh, if, you have the, if you have the bandwidth and you know that won't bog you down, it would be an interesting test, you know, to, to send a, a spousal specific letter. But we have okay. agents that don't do that; just send out the standard letter and one and do just fine with it. One thing Chad always says: whether you're calling the surviving spouse or, you know, the oldest kid, you know, a thousand miles away, you know. Let them know what you can do and then finish up with some kind of an open-ended question. You know, either, you know, what's been the most difficult part of this for you so far or, um, you know, what do you, what do you need the most help with or even just, you know, tell them what you do and then say, how can I help you? You know, leave, finish with an open-ended question and let them tell you what they need the most help with rather, like right. Chad said, than just leading with, oh, I can sell your house right away. That That's going to turn off that segment, you know vast majority of the time that's probably the last thing you want to do and like chad said it it is what almost everybody else does right makes sense it makes sense yeah and there's sometimes i mean it it, it appears like it's a spouse other times it's a separate last name but the same address um do people and and the other thing i was seeing i'm just curious do people who are going through probate will they will they put like a PO box address for all mail related to the probate transaction? Um, I mean, normally just, normally it's the PR's primary residence is the, the, the you know the PR mailing address. Okay. I'm just seeing quite a few PO boxes. So wasn't sure now, Again, when you look I'm, at that, when you when you I'm see just, a PO box, look and look and see if it's the same mailing address as the attorney, because it might be one of those cases where they died intestate and it's a court appointed executor, and those guys you really want to call because it's their you know it's their full time job to do probate you know to be the executor to be the fiduciary. Those people you really want to reach out to. So right. you know if yep. if you do get a PO box, just look and see if it's the same as the attorney. But you shouldn't see a ton of those. I mean, the vast majority of them we get, you know, one, two, three Maple Avenue. It's usually a, a a mailing address for the executor. Right. Okay. I'm just like I said. I'm just seeing these for the first time and just got yep. uh, my first round of current leads actually this morning. Um, awesome. But I I had bought the previous month's uh, leads as well just to kind of start getting some letters out so yeah. uh, smart smart thing to do letters. so i'm just getting started and just trying to you know you see things for the first time and not sure exactly yeah. no great great questions i'm sure you weren't the only one that had it so thank you so much and please keep coming back and you know every week on these calls and uh thanks for participating we appreciate it sure just trying to learn as much as i can <laughs> okay great thank you Next up is phone number ending in 7313. You're up next. Hey, good morning. This is Bob from Southern California. Uh, hey, Bob. We've had a couple issues with the do not call list. Uh, how are you dealing with that? When you've had issues, you've had people complain, I'm on the do not call yeah. list? Yeah, I, I had one lady. She, was just, she just went off on me. Um, huh. So, you know. I, yeah, we don't, we don't hear that. We don't hear that very often at all because typically if someone's the executor, you know, they're kind of given permission. Here's my information. I'm the one to contact regarding this estate. But uh, that's kind of what I thought too. But I just, yeah. you know, I didn't yeah. know if there was that kind of procedure or something I should be doing specifically when I run across that. What would you recommend, Chad? Well, 
I mean, it's something we've definitely looked at doing for you guys. It, it's, you know, that whole, the, the whole DNC registry is, it's complex. It adds a lot of complexity to what we do, so it just hasn't gotten done. Mainly because it hasn't been a concern. This might be the second time in five years that I've heard somebody, who, you know, who had a complaint. Um, as long as you're not calling that same person back repeatedly, I don't think you have liability. And our attorney shares in that opinion. Um, it's one of the things we asked when we first started, and it's it's the legal opinion on our end that by them them being a public figure, like a public admin, a, you know, an administrator. The link between the estate and the public, then it's not a violation of privacy or, or you know, it, it, you're not breaking laws by by contacting people off of public information. Okay, um, I'm, not an, I'm not an attorney, but as long as you're not, you know, DNC is really if you continuously solicit people who are on the do not call or you do it at, at unreasonable hours, like outside of, I think, at 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., that's when it looks really bad, um, you know, if they, if you do get recorded. But if you're just reaching out, they say, take me off the list, and you opt them out, it's, it's, you're not going to get in trouble. I mean, they're, they're a public figure that you're trying to reach out with an offer of help, and it's one and phone call. And Chad, I think what he asked was how you how would you respond if someone said, um, you know, hey, you shouldn't call me. I'm on the do not call list. I mean, I I would I would just be respectful and take the, I would I would opt them out of my list um, if, if they didn't want to speak. Okay. I would say, you know, listen, it's, we try to make sure to reach out to every personal representative because we know the earlier we can speak with you, the more we the more potential we have to help. Um, you know, is there anything that, that you could use help with, with before I go? Is there anything that that's you know you guys could use some help with as far as the estate's concerned? And if they say no, just get off. Um, you know, if they if they don't want you to contact them. Um, Sounds good. I appreciate it. Thank be. you. All right. Good news is, well, you know, you could go probably the next five years, and it probably won't happen again. So you just got it out of the way. Yeah. You, got, you got it out of the way with one of your first calls. That's good. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, All right. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 2554. You're up next. Oh, hi, guys. Uh, this is Jen. Hi, Jen. And Yes. Um, this is actually just my first month of uh, making uh, calls, and um, I encountered um, a probate lead that told me that um, everything's already being handled uh, from the estate sales, uh, clean-out services, repairs and remodels, and also they already have an attorney. So what he's already willing to sell the property, but um, the main objective that he gave me was um, what what sets you apart from their um, other real estate agents? Um, do you have um, other scripts that we can actually use, or is there other services that we can provide for them? Sure. So is he doing all that stuff himself? Or I guess, or is, is that all being done by a professional or by, by the, the, the heirs? Um, when I actually asked him that, he told me that it has been taken care of by the people that they already know. Okay. Well, I would say the reason I asked him, what I would say is, the, you know, listen, Mr. Smith, the, the, what you've already done for yourself is really rare. Um, a big part of what we do is try to focus on the overall estate, you know, the, the picture of the estate, and then we find ways to do all the things you just told me you've already accomplished. Um, now, I will say this, you kind of stopped at, you know, at having the, the, the home sold. We actually take it a step further, and we try to make sure that, that future generations of your family won't go through this again. So what makes us different is we do all the other things that you met, you just mentioned that most realtors don't do, but we kind of consider you a lifetime client of ours. So your family is our family, and we're going to make sure that you speak with our you know, when you, once you have your inheritance, you'll have an opportunity to speak with our CPA, to meet with our financial advisor team, and to sit down with our estate planning team. So not only can we help you preserve and grow your inheritance, we can make sure that future generations don't have the 4 to 7% cost of probate when it comes time to have, you know, other estates, mm -hmm. when, other, when other estates need to be handled. 
So all you can do is just show him that, you know, there's still some things he hasn't thought about or whoever's helping him hasn't thought about and hopefully open that conversation up and he'll give you more specifics and hope that maybe the home's not listed yet. Um, and you mm-hmm. can have an opportunity to kind of put, to show him, okay, so listen, it sounds like you either have figured a lot out on your own or you're working with someone that's a, well above average. Uh, I still encourage you to meet with them, but I'd like the opportunity to sit down and kind of show you what we do A to Z. Uh, mm-hmm. If you could think of our service, Mr. Smith is kind of the hub and a wheel. And we sit in the middle at, at the hub level. We kind of, you know, we assemble the team, vet the team, make sure everybody is on the same page and is professional. And we bring in as many of the strokes as we need to. And it sounds like you've done a good job of kind of getting started. Um, but I can show you how we can help you get through all of this and even, you know, what happens beyond that. Would Friday at 3 be a good time? So and one I'm thing I was going to go. Yeah, one thing I was just going to add real quick that we always mention, um, you could say, well, one thing I didn't hear you mention there was your insurance. So you've already taken care of, you know, switching to a vacant home policy. And I bet he hasn't. Uh, that's a, that's one thing that almost nobody does. Nobody advises them. And we talk about that on almost every call. If the house has been empty mm-hmm. more than a month, their insur- insurance may not be in effect. So if they don't, you know, you could that'd be just another question. If you can find anything you can do that they that hasn't been recommended to them before, especially by an attorney, really makes you stand out. And that's a good go to one if they don't mention it. And if they do I mean the rare case they say, Yeah, we've taken care of that. Okay, great. Then, you know, go into what Chad just said. All right. All Makes right. sense. Thank you guys. Yes. All right. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right. Next up is phone number ending in 2468. You're up next. Hey, guys. It's Matt out in Southern California. Hey, Matt. Hey, um, I got I got two questions for you. Um, do we have a uh, out-of-county referral network for each other where we could, you know, earn like a 25% shared commission for a, a, a property that's for sale out of the county that we're working on? Uh, I had a client said, gosh, what a what a great service you provide. Can you help me sell my property on the East Coast? And I was like, uh, well, let me look into it. It's funny, Matt. We just got back from our – yeah, we just got back from our planning. <clears throat> I've had three of those this week where the agents contacted me and said, do you have anybody? And in all three cases, we referred them to another agent. And funny, one of the agent's assistant called back and said, no, do we have to give you guys 25% and the agent? And I said – Absolutely not. It's just one of the, you know, it, it, that's we, we're glad to share those with our subscribers. Um, yeah. Probably the most the most efficient way to do it would be go go to our our closed Facebook group because almost everybody in all the leads mastermind on Facebook, yeah. almost everyone in there is an existing subscriber of ours. A majority of them are, and do a post there, and then you know somebody will pro- likely respond in your county. That would probably be be the quickest way to get a response. Would you yeah. Would you agree, Chad? Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. I, I gave out one this morning, uh, two actually. Um, so if, if you post in that group, Matt, it's usually a matter of minutes before somebody will raise their hand and say, hey, it's me. Um, if you if you post in there and nobody says anything a day or two, um, if I don't catch it and email you to connect you with somebody, uh, you can email support and just say, hey, guys, I'm looking for an agent in and give us the county name, and we can we can point you with someone who's qualified to somebody who's qualified. Yeah, and, and who who do I missed what you said? Who should I email it to if I don't get a response? You can email support at all the leads. Support. Oh, okay. Com. Okay. Do that, and then we'll we'll okay. connect you with a subscriber. But it's usually quickest to just jump in the Facebook group and say, "Hey guys, I've got a referral in X county. <laughs> who who's working that market?" And somebody will usually raise their hand. Good. Okay. So I got a second question for you. Um, sure. I got talked to two professional fiduciaries, and they both got mad at me because the letter I sent went to their home address, not their business address. And I I didn't have an explanation for them because I figured if they were listed as the administrator to the estate, their business address would have been listed, not their home address. Um, 
am I confused or did, is that just a kink in the system or did they actually go in and mistakenly put their home address in? I mean, they gave it to whoever in the county clerk's office did the data input, received it from, I would think, from them. Yeah. I mean, I didn't think you guys went out hunting for people's addresses. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Yeah, you just might okay. – I would just say next time, well, that's exactly what appears at the uh, courthouse. You know, if you want to change it, you might want to contact the clerk's office, put a different address okay. in there. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it almost guaranteed that's what happened. You know, they just yeah, kind of, okay. yeah, mindlessly did that. All okay, right, cool. thank you. P appreciate it, sir. Next up is phone number ending in 2583. You're up next. Are you there? Phone number ending in 2583. Hello, hello. Yeah, they, hi, I'm here. Hi there. They just unmuted me. Um, yes, ma'am. This is Ronit. I'm from New York. And um, my question is, when you have a $0 transfer and it's between people who are related, you know, it comes up in the leads that you send us, what do you make of that? Because it's not necessarily someone has passed, right? So you wouldn't, I mean, we wouldn't pull a lead based on transfer information. We only, we're, the leads that are in our system are only coming from probate records. Now, are you saying that you looked at the leads in our system and then went and did a search and you saw it was a $0 transfer? Yes. Okay. And what was the date of the transfer? Was it before the date of death and the data that we gave you? Um, I have to look at my notes. Uh, but, so uh, what's, what's what's most likely, Rene, is that somebody they they knew mom or dad was was getting in bad shape and they probably weren't going to be able to take care of the home, and they needed to free up. They they needed some liquidity to afford long term care. So what normally happens is the family will so be pro they'll proactively zero dollar transfer the home. If you do that twelve months prior to you know, needing long-term care, then Medicaid will immediately pick up the bill. Like if you don't have any assets and you have to go into long-term care, then Medicaid will, will pay for your, your long-term care as long as you have not, you know, you, you've moved the asset to another family member in the last 12 months. So what you're probably seeing are people who are aware of that and they're proactively moving assets prior to a death so they can, you know, qualify for Medicaid payments. Um, now, it could be if the transfer happened after the death, it could have been as simple as it was a, a spouse A to spouse B, and they held the, the property as uh, in joint tenancy. So when they filed the probate, they filed a spousal property petition, which immediately transferred the, the title from spouse A to spouse B, and that avoid that's one of the it's one of the exceptions of probate. So uh, a piece of real estate doesn't have to be included in the probate if it's held as in joint tenancy. And in some cases it does require that spousal property petition to be filed, but you could be seeing that. The easiest way to differentiate would be, you know, was the, the date of the last transfer before or after the date of death on the probate record? Okay. Um, so if it's, Situation A, where um, you know they transferred the assets, then how you know calling them and offering my services and the clean-out crews might not be the best thing, right? I mean, is there any other way to go about it? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's no different than any other call. And we, we, what we teach is focus on the people in the situation and then find ways to provide value and monetize it. So, you know, just pick up the phone and start the conversation. There's no better source of information than the family because they're going to know what they're going through, why the transfer happened, and, and you can, you know, start the conversation and get that from them. And then you'll you'll see ways that you can provide value in almost every phone call. You know, there's something you can do to help the folks. Um, 
you know, if they transferred title and, uh, if, you know, <coughs> nobody's living there, like let's say that, that they, it was a $0 transfer from father to son, son has his own life and his own real estate and, and this part property sitting there vacant, there's probably a huge motivation to sell that. Um, if it transferred from, you know, grand grandma to grandchild and grandchild is living there, then there might not be any way to really help them, but, you know, but you would know the story. So I, I would, I would still give them a call and find out from them. Don't try to deduce too much from the data. Just pick up the phone is usually the best practice. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. Thanks. Excellent. Great question. Thanks for asking. We have three more people in the queue. Uh, next up is phone number ending in 2583. You're up next. Okay. That's me again. Oh, um, okay. Do you have another question already? <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Hey, hang on there. Next up is phone number ending in 7718. You're up next. Uh, yes, my name is Carmen Zuniga in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, this is the first time that I opened this, my first 100 leads. And uh, what what did you say when it's the same name, the sorry, the same address from the, um, uh, let me see, uh, uh, attorney and the PR? Okay. Uh, what is the, the, the thing that you said, is, what happened when it's the same address? Yeah. Chad can probably explain it better than me, but it, it's probably a court-appointed yeah, so, attorney. Go ahead. Yeah, typically that's going to be a public administrator or a fiduciary, which is someone who professionally handles the, you know, the administration of the states. Uh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And typically, typically, if someone if they die intestate and they don't have a will and they don't have an heir appointed, then the court gets involved and they'll appoint a professional administrator trustee to you know to handle it to be the to be the representative and to make sure that you know everything is done fairly and and everything is completed and all the errors are you know treated correctly and uh, and we've said before we have a gentleman in southern california that made almost a million dollars last year he got he identified he looked for those people where it was the same because he realized they that was their occupation basically to as attorneys to administer estates to to be the court appointed uh administrator and the nice thing with dealing with them it's more of a business relationship they're not emotionally involved you know they're very willing to um uh, bill has gotten himself where he's got i don't remember how much many it was chad but i think he had three four five uh professional administrators that were all consistently sending him new deals you know before they even hit the probate court so that that is don't overlook those. Those are those are really good people to work out as far as a long term source of business for you. Oh great. Okay. Then I choose to send automatically my first mail. Who did you send? To the attorney or to the the family member? <laughs> no, we send we send to the um Unless you specify otherwise, we recommend that you mail to the the personal, uh, the PR, the executor, the family member. What is what means PR? Personal representative. Uh, personal representative. Yeah. Yeah, it's the same as executor. Okay. Their terms are interchangeable. But that the the personal representative, the executor, is the now business. Those are the people who are you know you know it's their decision who to list with and what to do with the property. You know, they're great to reach out to. Now, don't ignore the attorneys. They can be, like we just said, whether they're the court-appointed attorney or they're just an attorney to, who is doing specializing in probate, reach out to them because they can be a good long-term source of referrals. But we find, for the most part, that it doesn't make a lot of sense to mail to them because they usually have a gatekeeper, and your mail is probably going to end up in the trash can. It's not going to be effective. Got it. Okay. Um I now, there, there are. I'm just. I'm just going to say there are exceptions to that. We've had agents that um, have put like the probate case number on the envelope, or you know, done put a business envelope. We have had, had agents do okay with with the attorneys, but it, it's much more effective to mail to the executors and probably either call 
or show up at the attorney's office. Just wanted to yeah. clarify that. Go, go ahead. I saw that you put the phone number only from the personal representative and not from the attorney. Um, that's normal, or can we have the phone number of the attorney, or what do you suggest we work, how we work with the attorney? Well, <clears throat> most of the time we give you the attorney's phone number because it is on public data. Um, if it okay. wasn't there, then you mm -hmm. won't see it. But it's typically really easy to find. You just Google the attorney's name and his Google and the license mm -hmm. will come up. Okay, super. Um, okay. Okay, thank you so much for your help. I'm going to start working with this. Excellent. Welcome. And please keep coming back and participating in the calls. Thank you for doing so. We Right now we have two more people in the queue. We do have room for more. Just hit star six and then hit one. Next up is phone number ending in 1189. You're up next. Okay. Um, a couple of uh, quick questions concerning partnerships with the PR. I went on an appointment this past Saturday, and uh, the property needs, you know, a little work, but the PR has some people she knows in the industry, like, you know, roofers and things like that. So the value that I gave her in terms of positioning on the market is anywhere from 270 to maybe 315. The upper limit of a um, fully rehab unit is like around 390. So you can see there's not a, a whole bunch of space there. So she had mentioned, well, is there any way to partnership with the investor so she can make, you know, more money for the um, estate? Now, initially, I went through, you know, I was thinking about, okay, what can we do? But because she's already asking for so much or, you know, able to get so much because the property is free and clear, I don't see a way for her to partner with an investor to make more money. But I just want to kind of run it past you to make sure I'm not overlooking something, you know, creative. Now, I, I know if she had asked for something like maybe 200000 and she wanted maybe two ten or something like that, that maybe she can, you know, hold on to the property. Maybe the person can get her a little money up front. Then she doesn't get all her money until the place is fully renovated or rehab, and then maybe they can squeeze out an extra five or ten. But from what I can see, given the numbers from 270 to 315, and then the upper limit fully renovated would be 390, and the place would need, um, in order for her to sell it around about 315, she has to still do a roof and clean the basement out and, you know, basic stuff like that, get the personal items out and, you know, touch up the hardwood floors, those sorts of things. So the question is this. Do you see any room in that for her to partner with, an investor, and then the second thing is what types of um, uh, PR investor partnerships have you seen, or do you even recommend it? Because they still will own the property. It seems very risky to me for an investor to, um, you know, invest with a PR unless there's some way for them to, uh, you know, actually own the property, but then it becomes risky for the PR. Great question, by the way. This is something we teach in probate mastery that not many people will ever say yes to. So the fact that you uncovered one is pretty exciting. You got, you got a neat, neat, uh, <coughs> a neat trial here. So you, I, I think I tracked with all the numbers. So it's basically 315 would be the as is value right now. If we were to put it on ML, or the retail value right now and as is condition. Yeah, between but between, you think we between could 270 get between 270 and 315 because depending on what she does, but it does need quite a bit of work, particularly in the basement, the roof, you know, getting the hardwood floors back, buffed and, and painting stuff like that. Okay, so you're talking about uh, at least a seventy-five thousand dollar equity spread, right? Between uh, yeah, yeah, uh, well, almost yeah, but but you know, consider she has to close that uh, that the investor either buy it or have to close and give seller subsidy and all that stuff upon resale. Mm -hmm. It seems okay. tight to me. Then then the house itself would need. This is a big a kind of a wild swing at it. Uh, I know at least fifty thousand, if not more. It probably needs more than that to actually get it back fully renovated and rehabbed. Because the concept was to get, um, you know, do a few things in it to appeal right, to so a let's, retail let's, buyer. So yeah. let's, let's assume that 270 is today's as is value. Okay. And let's just assume that let's build in a, 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 a buffer there and say it needs sixty thousand sixty thousand dollars in work. Okay. So that puts us at three thirty. So that means we have sixty thousand dollars in equity on the table. That okay. can be split between an investor and the family. 
Now, if you have an investor who is, who, who you know, they're flipping 10 houses and they don't have cash right now, but they have the skill set, it's right. going to be a really, really attractive deal to them because they can come in, the family provides the real estate, they provide the capital for construction and, and the crews and do the work, and then it goes on the market. So I think you've got the potential for a deal here because you have, I mean, you've got 60 grand on the table. So it can be, you know, they can split the net profit 50-50. If you think about it, it's basically an interest-free loan for a house for an investor of $270,000. So he doesn't have to come up with acquisition money if the house is just, you know, provided to him. So it's like an a, a interest-free $270,000 hard money loan. Like normally they would be paying two to four points up front and 10 to 12% yeah. to a hard money lender. Yeah. So it could be really, really attractive to the right investor who's, who's got crews that they need to keep busy but doesn't have enough inventory right now. So hopefully you've got a strong buyer's list to do that. As far as the structure, what state are you in? I'm in Maryland. Yeah, I would sit down with a real estate attorney. Like find out who the investors in your town are using. A good way to find a creative real estate attorney is talk to, talk to the people in your local real estate investors association or your real. Oh, yeah, I have one. I have one from okay. going to the real estate over the years. All right, cool. So sit down with that, that attorney and say, listen, I want to make sure that, that we can do this. But the way that they can be structured, so you can roll the, you can, you can transfer, do a $0 transfer into a new LLC. And the investor owns 50% of the shares, the home, the, the estate owns 50% of the shares. And then the operating agreement defines the intent of, of the, you know, of, of the company. The other thing you can do is a land trust. Um, at least in Virginia, you can, I'm not sure in Maryland, but talk to, talk to the attorney about using a, a limited partnership agreement, a land uh -huh. trust and a fresh LLC. To, to protect to, to make sure that, that all parties are protected because you need to do a title search before it rolls out so you know you're not giving the investor you know half of a liability instead of an asset but you also need to make sure that you protect the family against investor abuse and vice versa so what happens if he plows fit 60 grand into this house and then uncle joey decides to move in well hell we wouldn't sell it this place is grandma's house is beautiful now the investor right. needs to be able to control the sale. You know, another so thought, Belinda. Sure that... Yeah. Go ahead, Chad. Just no, I, I'm sure just going to. Whatever instrument is used offers, you know, the risk mitigation for both both parties. And the attorney is going to be, you know, I would go to the attorney that you would use to put it together <clears> and say, listen, help me put this together before I go talk to my investors. So, you know, they have a clear idea of what, it look, what the deal looks like. Linda, I was going to compliment you. You're probably our most creative, think outside the box <laughs> agent because you've you've had a lot of interesting deals. I remember you had one that you were attempting to uh, uh, finance through a pawnbroker, or you know somebody that was a hard money lender who was a pawnbroker. The other thing that it just occurred to me that would be it might be more difficult to find, but might even be a simpler solution if you could find a contractor who would do the repairs and wait, you know, maybe 90 days to get paid. Um, you know, yeah. 90, 90 days, same as cash. That might be a simpler way to do it. It might be more difficult to find that person. Well, mm, okay, because, you know, see, part of the issue, too, and I think why other investors probably looked at her side eye was because she wanted to be quite a bit involved in selecting the um, various uh, vendors and contracts. Like she wanted to, to be the one to pick the roofer. She wanted to be the one to pick the tree person. She wanted to be the one that. I got you. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought it was a little bit dangerous in this case because she actually wanted to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> makes Yeah, it makes sense. Just giving you an extra so, option there. But yeah, no, yeah. Good, good job thinking outside Belinda? the box. Huh? Does she, have, does she have experience or does she just watch HDTV a lot? No, she she doesn't have actual hands-on experience, but she just, because her brother actually is in the building industry, but he won't take the time to do it. He's in the building industry, so she knows people that do, you know, the roof. She knows people that can probably buff the floors, you know, that kind of thing. And tell you the truth, I actually was looking for a project to do myself to do the elephant mouse thing on. I have an investor that, you know, um, I'll just put up the money that's used for the hard money interest payment. And you know, learn some of the trade, and then the investor kind of guides me through that kind of stuff. 
So I don't think this would be a, that project because it's too extensive. I mean, too much work needs to be done in that, that particular place, and it's too convoluted. But, um, hmm, okay. I have to how think many, about uh, Let me ask you this. How many heirs are on, on this estate? Three. It's two brothers. One of them is out of the country. One of them's in the country. And then the the, the um the sister, and that's the one I've had contact with. She's the one that's the PR. And, of course, she's, you know, trying to bring both brothers down to earth in terms of what to expect in terms of price point and stuff like that. Because, you know, people always have these astronomical expectations. <laughs> and they don't think about the fact that, you know, this place needs extensive repairs and, you know, people are not really – investors in particular, and even buyers, you know, they don't have this sentimental value because this is the place you grew up in, you played in the backyard, you did this, you did that. They're not really interested in that, you know. Um, so, but, um, okay, okay, you give me some things to kind of think about. I thought the margins was like really, because if she did the, the few things she said she was going to do, uh, I mean, the roof, which we discussed, you know, the hardwood floors, clean out of the basement, that kind of thing, she can just take the 315 just straight ahead without any complications. You know, if she gets involved with a investor, although the price point could potentially go up to three ninety, um, I don't. This is kind of that's a little confusing for me. It seems like it's kind of tight to me. And then plus, suppose it doesn't sell for three ninety, suppose it sells for three seventy five or something. You know, then what happens? So it seems to be convoluted to me. But I just want to check and see if you know is there something I'm overlooking? Is there something I'm missing? You know. But um okay. No, you. I'm kudos to you. I mean, you you got a really good creative mind. Like you you've seen opportunities. So, what I would say is, even if you don't think it's the best option for her, yeah, take that option, take it back to her, and sure that you're the person that put this together. Like you you know people, you know how it needs to be structured, but you don't recommend it. So show her like if if you really want to do this, I can I can make it happen. But I think it's in your best interest to just do a light rehab and sell today for three fifteen versus taking on all this additional risk and a business partner just to split the profit. Yeah, because I I, I kind of sort of got back with her and kind of told you know kind of told her that that you know it's it's um it's it's quite risky what she's talking about doing you know and it's kind of convoluted. Versus just you know doing using the people she wants to use, doing a few items that I uh, indicated she probably needs to do in order for VA and FHA you know potential buyers to get it, and um, you know call the day. So, but uh, okay, all right, thanks. Thanks as oh. always, Belinda. We we have two more in the queue. Did you have something else, Belinda? You're good. You know what? I had asked a general question: What types of partnerships do you see, and if you even recommend it? But apparently, you, you don't mind recommending it. But um, do you see partnerships between the PRs and, you know, actual investors in order for the PR to make more money? Sometimes. It's it's common in the Bay Area. I yeah. I have a friend who, who partners with homeowners to tear the homes down. So he'll partner with, you know, typically their old, older homes that, that today's buyer isn't really looking for. Right. So take like an old, a mid-century home, raise it. And then get the permits and plans in place in place with the city. Oh, okay. So it's a major rehab then. It's a full on rehab. No, I mean it doesn't take long to tear a house down. Um, okay. So they, I mean, they they get the permits, they roll in, raise the structure, and then they go and submit plans and get permit building permits in place, and then put it uh -huh. back on the market. So you can take a piece of land with a house oh, on see, it and sell it, sell it for more money, almost twice as much money if okay. it's a shovel-ready project. So right, you basically right, right. Sell okay. it as a, you sell it as a pre-construction listing, not as a vacant lot. And okay. I have okay. a friend who's made, I bet he's made a million and a half bucks on that, um, just profit sharing with the family. And they would they wouldn't know, you know, the family oftentimes they think, well, my God, we got to do all this work to this house. When in reality, it's a lot cheaper, and you can make a lot more money just to tear it in that market, just to tear it down and, and sell it as a shovel-ready product. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. All down. right. Th thanks right, a lot, thanks. Linda. We have two more in the queue this week. Uh, next up is phone number ending in five five six four. You're up next.
You're up, 5564. Looks like Edwina, are you there? Going once, going twice. Edwina, 5564. She must have had to take another call. Let's go to phone number ending in 6370. You're up. Hi, this is uh, David in Charlottesville, Virginia. Hey, David. Hi. Uh, I had a question on uh, obituary marketing. Okay. The um, question is when uh, when I when I do the research and I find out that if there is real estate attached, um, but then I find out that there's um, the uh, the the tax record shows that the uh, the billing address is a different property. So now I have the uh, one property with an, a, you know two different addresses. So I'm wondering, is it is it worth mailing? to one or both of those or you know these are not leads so, that we're I mean, providing because we we don't do that but go ahead chet so you're saying you're pulling obituaries then you're going to tax records and you're finding an absentee owner um well it might be in the same city so it looks like they own multiple properties okay. now have the same but owner that same fine. owner has the same owner has multiple properties and it may or may not be the decedent, um, or there may be an heir because only only one person died, so there's there there is a successor. Well, so my opinion is wait until it's a probate filing and mail to the personal representative's address. But if you're going to do obits, then you would mail to not not the the situs address or the, the the physical property address you would mail to the uh, owner's tax mailing address. Yes. I mean, right. it could be a vacant house. It could be a ten tenant occupied. So you're more likely to get your mail opened by a decision maker if you mail to the tax mailing address, not the, not the property address. Okay, that makes sense. What's your experience on success rate of OBITs? Uh, I choose not to do it. I think it, it just doesn't fit with my morals and values. Um, probate is a signal to the world that they're ready to deal with an estate. Um, I haven't done much with obits other than try to use them to identify trust um, and, and mainly research stuff, but I haven't really, I haven't actually done the marketing to them. Right. Okay. All right. Appreciate it. That's All right. Appreciate it. Not a problem. We have two more in the queue. Edwina, you're back. Five, five, six, four. Can you hear us now? I can. I had my phone muted earlier. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Glad you got uh, back. Go ahead. This is Edwin and Potter. I'm in Flower Mound, Texas. My assistant and I were going through the letters and stuff, and I'm not sure if this is the right call to ask this. Sure. Um, the letters and things that are in there, I mean, it shows letter one, letter two, letter three. Some of it is we started going through in has the order proven and we should just leave it alone or some of it seemed out of whack to us and we started you know personalizing the letters that kind of thing so just curious about that because like letter three or four seemed like more an introductory letter or is it just more the repetition of because they're not going to remember the other three letters anyway um, so i find that the timing matters more than the content I mean, all the letters that we provide have produced multiple, multiple millions in commissions by at this point. Um, I've done a lot of testing with switching up letter, like <clears throat> the same letter multiple times versus a sequence of letters. And mm -hmm. honestly, I've never really been able to see a measurable difference. Um, I have seen consistent results. Like I, I averaged about 6% and I tracked every piece of mail and every phone call. But regardless of I was sending probate options three times or this one, two, three sequence, um, I always seem to achieve the same results. So it's more about timing than than the content. Yeah, okay. Um, I will say that I, the, the content is important. Like I'll say our letters content compared to what you might find elsewhere, our letters tend to stick around and make more of an impression. In mm -hmm. markets where it's fiercely competitive, we hear – at least once a week, I speak. Someone calls me and tells a story, but it, like 
where the, the, the PR has gotten 30, 40, 50 letters, but they were the only one that called. Like, or I set your letter aside. I'm glad you called me. Um, uh -huh. It was, I think it was on Probate Mastery last week. We had a story about that. So in a, I think it was somewhere in Southern California, super competitive market. They took the listing <clears throat> and said, well, how, you know, what? Well, they actually made the outbound phone call, and they're like, "Oh, I remember you. Your letters on the top of the pile. It's actually I quit opening them after I read yours." So yeah. the content is important, but don't okay. get wrapped around the the wheel, you know, the axle of of I gotta have the perfect sequence. Just make sure, just you know, get it out there on a, on a consistent basis, and you should do fine. And that's what we're doing. We're on our second round of letters getting ready to go out. We did have the probate data leads. And we've actually had some go out as far as the fourth letter. So some of that I see that those are now loaded into the system. Do you send a pin out with the mailer or do we send you the pins that we ordered? How does that work or does it matter? Are so you a Frank Patrick? Frank, Frank Patrick system? Yes. Yeah, so you can you can email or call. You can call in at the number on, on all the lead .com in the top right. Or you can uh -huh. email support <clears throat> support at all the leads, and we will probably Tim will help you out with getting you an address and instructions for shipping your your widgets. Um, uh, we are okay. doing that now, so you'll you'll actually ship the widgets to us, and then we'll okay. we'll, we'll fulfill your mail for you. Oh, okay, all right, because we were getting our costs down. My assistant doing it. There's so much she could do if she wasn't doing that. Um, last piece well, I'll tell is, you, so we we've been able to get the cost down. So where it's costing you eighteen dollars, not including mm -hmm. labor, um, mm -hmm. we're able to get that down to twelve ninety nine because of our relationship with the postal service and because we can buy from the widget vendors in volume. Um, mm -hmm. Surprisingly, we were able to cut your campaign cost by like thirty percent and automate it. So we should save you some money. Oh, okay. Yeah, because we're just looking at it. It's just taking up a gargantuan amount of time. Um, last thing is also looking to leverage the phone calls. So the phone calls, are, the way I understand it, is one per month after the mailer, each mailer. Um, well, that's up to you. I mean, you can order as many as you would like. We recommend as a, at a minimum follow each letter with a phone call. So you'll see, <clears throat> excuse me, when you go to subscriber portal in the top, you'll look under mailbox motivator, mm -hmm. order mark, order marketing campaign. And at the bottom of that page, you can choose calls, letters, um, or letters and calls. So if you were just going to do a call campaign, you'd select calls. And then you tell us whether it's the personal rep or the attorney, and then how many calls you want to make. And you, then you can lay out your schedule right there. So it could be if you want to call them once a month for the next year, you can lay out a 12 month call sequence and we'll fulfill it based on your schedule. Okay, and then it's just basically 250 per call until either they talk to someone or they just leave a voicemail at the beginning. It's 250 per lead. So we give you up to four numbers. So we don't, we're not charging you at the call level, but at the lead level. Okay, if, if I wanted it to continue past the four mailings, the follow up. Then is it just still two? It's just two fifty per lead. It is, yeah. So okay. just whenever you set up your sequence, just make sure you you know let put it out and as far as you need. To let go. me. I wanted to say too. That's one of the values of using our CRM, <clears throat> because mm -hmm. if you have, let's just say you have a hundred leads and they call the hundred leads, they're gonna identify you know thirty of them that aren't interested. They're gonna identify you know twenty of them that have already sold their property, and then you know maybe they'll get you a dozen leads and there'll be a dozen that they didn't read. So every time they do the campaign, there'll be there'll be a diminishing number that you're going to want to call again. So it does get cheaper. You know, it, it might go from 100 to 40 to 20 to by the fourth month, mm -hmm. it might just be down to a dozen leads that you haven't already listed or spoken to or dealt with. You follow me? Wow. So you okay. can go, that you can go, sense. you can, you're going to get the comments in the CRM on all their conversations. And then you can go in there before you, before you order your next, um, you know, before the next uh, call campaign goes out and just delete the ones or hide the ones that you don't want to be called or mailed again. So, you know, you don't want to keep mailing or calling people that you've already disqualified. So it, it gets, right. the subsequent campaign should get substantially cheaper than the initial one. 
Right. And then, you know, just each month adding on, we were just trying to come up with a basically a per month cost of what we were going to be setting up. And then on them doing, ISAs doing the calls, what are the stats for them doing the calls, I guess, or do you have any comparison versus me doing the calls? Does it matter? Um, We're tracking at about 3% conversion. So the last okay. time I was a pulled statistics, I mean, we were looking at 48, 48 leads to get an appointment, and then two and three appointments were turning into closing. So that's about a 3% conversion just on the phones, not including okay. any, anything that you get, you know, inbound from the mail campaign. And by the way, one of my sales pe- one of my salespeople, Darcy, just uh, texted me, and she's right. Um, I misstated that. You don't want to delete the lead. You just you just want to exclude them from calls or mailings. You don't have to delete it out of your system. So I think I stated that incorrectly. Do you follow me? Well, right, in case they do respond to a mailer versus a call. Yeah, because we Correct. found where yeah. you can show to exclude them. So we figured that piece out. Exactly. Yeah, don't delete them, exclude them. I think I said delete. Just wanted to correct okay. that. Oh, okay. All right. Good <laughs> answer, Jen. Right now the challenge is me getting to the calls, and then, oh, my gosh, here she's bringing the next month's worth. And I'm like, ah, you're killing me. So, okay, perfect. That's what I needed. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you and welcome. And our last, boy, this is perfect. We're going to almost end on time. Our last caller this week, phone number ending in 7578. We saved the best for last. I'm sure you have a great story or question for us, right? No pressure. Well, I I don't know if it's a great story or anything, <laughs> but uh, my question was uh, I went to the courthouse here in my town the other day and asked about getting the probate list and they at first didn't know what I was talking about (laughs) so I kind of explained to them and they told me the only way you can get any I could get anything off the probate list was to have a specific name or a specific address right is that the case or is there something I something else I need to ask for? Typically, it's not. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a public record. You can go into the records room and, and pull that. What what market are you in? Uh, I'm in Bowie County, Texas. Bowie, Texas. Uh, I'm I'm what ca- close what county Texas, is that? Texarkana. Texarkana is in Bowie County, part of it. Uh, okay. It's in northeast Texas. Yeah, so I mean, I've never seen. Uh, there's nowhere in Texas that we're aware of that we can't pull leads. Um, we do. Uh, we're. <clears throat> I don't know for sure. I would say at least the 20 largest counties in Texas we have subscribers yeah. in. Yeah, it's it's. I think it is the biggest county in Texas, as far as I'm as far as I know. But that's uh, yeah, so B O B O B O W. B O W I E, right? That's where you spell it. Right, right. Okay. So yeah, I'm just but I want to so get, we'll... want to get into y'all system, but I just can't right now because I just got laid off from my job and I started trying to do the wholesale and I just got to get some money together to be able to get into y'all system. I just can't do it right now. Sure. Yeah, we understand no, I... that. And. You, you can see the courthouse is an extension of the government. They don't do anything logically or efficiently, and they, they really tend to discourage people from down there poking around their files. So I, I think you might have gotten some bad information to whoever you, from whoever you happen to speak to that day. We do have some courthouses that have bizarre rules, like you can only get 10 leads at a time, or we have one courthouse, Philadelphia, where they charge you $3 every time you open a file file just to see what's in there. We have some... Colorado counties where you can only collect them from, you know, 12 to 3, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So there there are some strange rules, but I it's public information. It's public records. I can't see where they could exclude you from going through those files. So I might well, you Jim, might want to just go back go back again. I'm sorry, Tim, you had something you wanted to yeah, add? Yeah, the only thing I was going to say is that there, I mean, there are definitely uh, courthouses and court systems that require us when we are gathering information to do exactly what he's saying, which is that we don't just walk in and, you know, say, show us all the probates. There are other places that they're, they're, they they don't make this easy, and that's, of course, why we spend our time doing this. But 
sometimes we have to go in and pull information from multiple sources to get the names of recent decedents and then literally do exactly what they said, feed those back into the court system and pull that information down. So I mean, if you're just simply trying to find a few to go take a look at, maybe one of the things I would suggest that you consider doing is go grab uh, you know, whatever your local county uh, publication is that would publish death notices in your county and pull a few recent ones since you're you know, trying to do this on your own you know, pull a half dozen of them, take that half dozen, hop down to the courthouse and say, uh, you know, have these been filed? And you might want to wait a couple of weeks after the death notice has been posted and take a look, and that's a reasonable place to begin. I mean, sometimes probably it isn't filed instantly, and sometimes it's not filed for months and, and even years after the uh, after the death has occurred. just depends on local laws and, and, and the need for the people to do something with the property or the, the estate itself. But... I mean, that's a reasonable place to start. And we have to go through the same process you're talking about sometimes. Okay, so it'd, it'd probably be better to just go back, look at newspapers from three or four or five months back, maybe six months back, and start there and work forward. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I don't. I, my assumption is that it's probably not, you're in a county, that, the population is not a huge population, and that'd probably be a reasonable way to do it. Okay, okay. Well, that that gives me a starting point now. And all right, just, save up save up your closings and and let us do it for you when you're ready. Okay, appreciate it. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Great call, guys. That winds it up. And uh, hey, Jim. I, I all, yes, sir. Go ahead. Hey, before before you hop off, I, I made yep. a, a a quick thing at the very beginning, and I will tell you folks that are still on the call, uh, go to alltheleads.com forward slash premium leads. There's a simple form there and a quick explanation of this program. If you fill out the form, we'll get back to you uh, within a couple of days. Uh, first come, first serve. We're just kind of testing this. So if you're interested, take a look. All the information you need to know is there, and it's uh, alltheleads.com forward slash premium leads. Excellent. Guys, thank you so much, everybody who, who showed up today. I always end these calls the same way by thanking you for being here taking an hour and 10 minutes out of your out of your life and your business to show up in this call. I want to especially thank the people who uh, actively participated. And I always challenge you, you, you took the time to be here. So take one thought, one idea, one thing you heard shared on this call, go out and put it into practice. And please come back next Thursday and share your results with the group. Thank you so much, guys. Make it a great week. And we will talk to you same time next Thursday. Take care.